Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vantage Seminar. Now, we're very happy today to continue the series about Diophantine problems and rational points. And today we have Ji Young Gao, who's going to be speaking about sparsity of rational points on curves, what is known, and what is expected. So, uh, Ji Young, is it all right if we record this talk? Yes. Wonderful. And um, and feel free to ask questions during the talk. Okay, Xiang, please go ahead. Okay, uh, so thanks for the invitation. Uh, today I'll talk about sparsity of rational points on curves, what is known, what is expected. Um, I'll start with the motivation of the question, which is something very, very, uh, uh, dates back to a long time ago. It's a fundamental question in math to solve equations. And in this talk, I was focused on one kind of equation that's polynomial in two variables with coefficients in Q. And uh, the goal is to, to, uh, to, to see what can we say about the Q solutions to these polynomials? Can we find all of them? And can we, can we see uh, how they distribute and so on? Uh, and this question dates back to ancient Greek time and it's known as Dufantine problem nowadays. And uh, in modern language, it talks about rational points on algebraic curves. Uh, here are some examples we can see. In the first example, we have a polynomial of degree two. In the third, uh, second and third examples, we have polynomials of degree three. And in the fourth example, we have a polynomial of degree six. Uh, the number of rational points or Q solutions for these polynomials uh, are different. Like in the first and third examples, they are infinite and many. But in the first example, there are many, many small ones. But in the third example, starting from the, this one, uh, the numerator and the denominators are very, very large. In the second and fourth examples, we both have only finally many rational solutions. And why is that? Uh, what is the reason behind this? Well, to, to solve these questions, we first of all uh, uh, draw the algebraic curve associated to each polynomial. And then in the first example, the curve has genus zero. In the second and third examples, the curve has genus one. And in the fourth example, the curve has genus two. So in the end, it's actually gonna be the, the genus of the curve, which, uh, uh, which implies these phenomenons of finitely many or infinitely many solutions. And when there are infinitely many, whether there are many small solutions or not. And this philosophy is what we call geometry governs arithmetic. So in the rest of my talk, I will explain this question according to the genus of the curve, the geometry. Uh, first of all, let's set up some notations. G and D will be two integers and K is a number field of degree D and C is an irreducible smooth projective curve of genus G defined over this number field. And as usual, we use CK to denote the set of K points on C. When G is zero, well, uh, either CK is empty or C is isomorphic to P1 over K. So that's why whenever we have one rational solution or one rational point, then there are infinitely many and there are also many small ones. And in this case, we also have the so-called local global principle. When G equals one, the situation becomes much more complicated, but it's very, very interesting. Well, if there is at least one rational point then CK carries an extra structure of abelian groups with an identity element. And this identity element, we usually use no O to denote it. It's a rational point. So this is what we call an identity curve. It's a curve of genus one with the origin. And uh, because EK is an abelian group, so we know that EK is, has, a, has a torsion free part to the power of rho for some rho, which might be infinite a priori and the torsion part. The theory of model and way says that, well, EK is finitely generated. So rho is a finite number and torsion part is also finite. So somehow in order to understand the structure of EK, we have two parts to understand, this rho and the torsion part. For rho, in general, there, there is uh, uh, no effective method to calculate it. Uh, the biggest conjecture in this area is the Birch and Schwinton die conjecture. It claims that rho can be uh, express in an analytic way. So it's the order uh, it's the order of the L function uh, at S equals one. And here's a list of people who made contribution to this country, uh, to, to, uh, to this conjecture, which I copied from Wikipedia. So if you are not happy, just feel free to edit it. Well, now this conjecture is no if rho is small or equal to one. 
Uh, sometimes in practice, we only need some good upper bounds for this role. And there is an explicit upper bound for this role depending on the number field K and the elliptic curve. And it's very explicit. So C1 and C2 depends on the degree and the disc discriminant of the number field. And this, uh, the dependence on the elliptic curve is given by the conductor. This is proof and O and top in, in, uh, in 98 actually works for any abelian variety. Uh, a very, very open question is, is rho bounded above uh, regardless of E if we fix the number field? For example, if k equals q, do we expect to have a uniform upper bound for rho? Um, there are divergent opinions on these questions uh, over the years. Uh, well, in 2006, Elkis constructed an elliptic curve with very large rank is 28 under GRH. Well, in 19, 2019, Park, Poon, and Voigt, and Wood, they proved the heuristic, which suggests that rho is uh, at most 21 except for uh, at most finitely many uh, elliptic curves. Actually, they show that 100% of the elliptic curve has ranked uh, at most 21. Uh, so again, uh, still this question uh, has divergent opinions. Um, this is for the torsion-free part. As for the torsion part, uh, the, uh, the question is, is well answered uh, qualitatively. Uh, Mazur in, in 77 proved uh, that the torsion part is you, the cardinality is uniformly bounded, and his result was generalized by uh, Camiani uh, and Morel. So now we know that the cardinality of the torsion part is uniformly bounded solely in terms of the degree of the number field. And um, Mazur's result is, is even more explicit. He listed the possibilities for EQ tau. There are 15 possibilities. And when Mason proved this result, what he actually showed is that it's not directly on elliptic curves, but he showed, uh, he computed a set of rational points on certain curves, which are called modular curves, or X1N. He showed that when N is large enough, the, then the only rational points on the modular curve are the rational cusps. And the genus of these modular curves are easily computed. There are formulas for that. And uh, this genus is often greater or equal to two. So this suggests that even if we only want to study rational points on elliptic curves, curves of genus one, we sometimes need to pass to curves of higher genus. So this is uh, what is, uh, this is for elliptic curves. Um, for genus at least two, uh, a guiding statement in this, in this area is this model conjecture made about 100 years ago. It was proved by Falkins in 1983. It says the following thing. If the curve has genus at least two, then the set of rational points must be finite. Before moving on, let's look at, how, uh, what, how, uh, look at some features of this theorem, how strong it is. First of all, it's an extremely strong statement because the hypothesis is rather weak. It's just on this topological invariant that genus is at least two. But the, state, but the conclusion is really, really strong. It says that, well, there are only finally many rational points on this curve. If we go back to the polynomial, polynomial in two variables uh, uh, with coefficients in Q, it basically says that, well, if the polynomial has degree large enough, then this polynomial has only finally many rational solutions. So this is very, this makes the theorem really strong. And when compared with Mazur's results, which was proved before, is it immediately implies that this, this rational, this modular curve that we care about, they have only finally many rational points if n is large enough. On the other hand, uh, this, there's still, uh, there's certainly improvement for this, possible improvement for this theorem. For example, it's not constructive. Given any curve, you can't really read off the set CK uh, from the uh, proof of faultings uh, or from any known proof of model conjecture. And when applied to Mazur's result, well, Mazur actually need to compute a set of rational points on these modular curves to conclude, but faultings theorem cannot do it. Cannot do it. Uh, perhaps a more uh, famous example in this feature is for mass life theorem. So we have this polynomial, x to the power of n plus y to the power of n minus one equals zero. And when n is large enough, uh, at least four, then the genus is at least two. Then 
we can apply Falkins and immediately get that there are only finitely many rational solutions to this polynomial. But in this example, more is expected. We do want to know that the only rational solutions are the trivial ones, one of the x, y, and z, it's zero. And this was only proved uh, 12 years later by Wiles and Taylor Wiles using moder modularity. So it's a completely different proof. Uh, yeah. But on the other hand, it doesn't apply to any curve. And this example suggests that in general, if we want, if we have a curve of genus at least two, it's extremely hard to compute a set of rational points. Even for this one example for mass lab theorem, it took us, it took mathematicians hundreds of years. Uh, by the way, uh, Mazur's uh, Mazur's result is also used in uh, in for mass in the proof of Fermat. Um, instead, here is a more achievable but still fundamental question. Uh, studied by many people, Model, Way, many method faultings, many big names. Is there an easy upper bound for the cardinality? And how does the rational points distribute on the curve? Where can we find them? And where should we not expect to find them? Guided by this question, uh, we would divide the, this question into different grades, like finiteness of CK, upper bounds of the cardinality, uniformity of bounds of the cardinality, and effective model. And on this side, we will see some phenomenon uh, uh, about where to find the rational points or where not to find rational points and so on. Uh, the so before moving on, let's ex uh, let me explain what are the heights. Um, height is um, uh, a number which assigned which is assigned to each point uh, or algebra point uh, to measure its size. For example, if we have integers, we use absolute value to measure its size. But what if we have a rational number, a over b? How to measure its size? Well, there are two different ways. We can all we can still use the we can still use the absolute value to measure the size. But then, for example, one and one, uh, 101 over 100, they won't be too different. However, we do expect that uh, 101 over 100 is much more complicated than one. So this is why we, this is uh, what height says. So the height, naive height is defined to be the logarithm of the maximum of the numerator and the denominator for a rational number. If we write it down as uh, a, b, and z and uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, greater common divisor is one. So this is the height of irrational number. And on Pn of Q, uh, we can generalize this definition to points in Pn of Q. Uh, it's just that now we take x naught to xn and we choose a representative so that all these xi's, all these coordinates are in z and their greatest common divisor is one. Then the height of this point is log max of the absolute value of each one of them. Um, this definition can be generalized to arbitrary number field, uh, but the problem is usually an arbitrary number field doesn't have class one, so you can't uh, expect to write a number uh, in a unique way in this division. What we do is we consider all the, uh, all the places and write it down in this way. Um, they are equal, uh, when k equals q, it is equivalent to this definition, to, to this previous definition. Okay, if we can define it to arbitrary number field, and actually uh, this, this definition uh, doesn't depend on the choice of the number field and so on, if you have a point in Pn of q bar, then we, uh, we can define the uh, weight height, logarithmic weight height on Pn of q bar. So now we do have a height function on Pn of Q bar uh, defined in this way. And then we can also define it on any sub variety of Pn just by composing the height function on Pn and this inclusion. And two very important properties of this height that define in this way are, one of them is that the height is bounded from below the height of any point, just looking at this definition, it must be non-negative. Well, in general, if we work on height machine, then we do have a lower bound. Uh, it's, it's bounded from below. The second important property is the finite, is a finite statement. It's the so-called Noscott property. It says that the number of uh, uh, the, the number of po uh, the points with bounded height and bounded degree, the set of these points must be finite. For example, if we look at Q, 
So what does it mean? It means that the the saying that the height is bounded means that both the numerator and denominators are bounded. So of course there are finitely many rational numbers with this uh, uh, with this property. And in general, it's also true for our, uh, for points in QR with bounded degree. So these two properties are very, very important. We can define some functions later on on some other spaces, but to say that it's an actual height, you need to show these two things. And you uh, sometimes, and yeah, sometimes it's, it's one of the key step in some proofs. Okay, now we have introduced this, this number to measure the size of rational and algebraic points. Uh, now let's go on to the finiteness of rational points, and this was proved by Fultons. And here is uh, here is diagram that I extracted from uh, asterisk 127. So this is how Fultons proved the theorem. He proved many different things like Tate conjecture, Shabarevi conjecture, and so on. Um, I want to mention that what I want to emphasize for this proof is that in in, in fact Fulton's really proved is what Fulton's really proved this is this Sharpa-Revish conjecture, which is about integral points on modular spaces. He proved that on the modular space of principally polarized abelian varieties, there are only finitely many integral points, okay, as points for any k and s. And then using the so-called Kodava Parsing construction, this, this result on integral points on modular spaces implies the model conjecture, which is about rational points on curves. So this approach, it really, it, it's really approach to show something about integral points on modular spaces. And recently there is a new approach to treat this kind of problem by Lawrence and Bankatesh. Uh, they reprove Fulton's theorem by modifying something here. Uh, uh, but for example, like no, no Tate conjecture, no variation, yeah, and so on. They don't get the full Shaharevich conjecture, but they, they get something strong enough to conclude from model conjecture. Okay, um, in the proof of faultings, he introduced another kind of height on the modular space. Let me explain what it is. Uh, I won't give the, uh, the precise definition, but I'll explain the feature uh, which, goes on, which goes in this definition. Well, First of all, let's take any principally polarized abelian variety and faultings define an intrinsic number of uh, uh, associated with A. So this, this number, this number faultings height of A is defined just by looking at A, not putting it in the, uh, not necessarily putting it in the modular space. But then of course, if you can define this intrinsic number, you define a function on the modular space. Uh, of principally polarized abelian varieties. And we call it Fulton's height, but then why do we call it a height? Does it satisfy the two important properties that I mentioned before, bounded from below and not got property? The answer is yes. And this is a big result of our Fulton's. Um, so the, the way to prove it is by comparing this Fulton's height with the weight height that we mentioned before. So now let's fix an embedding of AG in PN over QR. Um, and then we do have this weight height, as we mentioned before, on Pn, which restricts to Ag. And Faulting's showed that we can compare these two heights, the Faulting's height of A and the weight height of the point parametrizing A. They are more or less compare; they are comparable in a linear way. Well, the difference is logarithmic because the modular space has logarith uh, has uh, the singularity of logarithmic singularity. So this was proved by Faultings, and uh, the constants were improved by Boss, David, and Basuki, and so on. The upshot of this comparison is that the Faultings height is bounded from below and the Noskot property. In fact, this is one of the most important steps in the proof of Faultings. Lawrence Venkatesh uh, removed the use of Faultings height in their new approach. Okay, so this number faulting height, now it becomes really uh, a very important uh, invariant for any for an abelian variety defined over QR. Okay. Now, uh, today in my talk, I will focus more on another proof of faulting theorem of model conjecture given by Voita in the early 90s. It is a completely different proof uh, and it is by Newt-Defantine method uh, and some Arrow law of geometry. Uh, the, 
Well, in this proof, again, we don't see the proof. Uh, 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 we don't prove uh, Tate conjecture or Shavarovic conjecture. But the advantage is that we see some description about where to find algebraic points on C, not only rational points, but also algebraic points. And they lead to a good upper bound on the cardinality. And later on, the proof was simplified by Bonberry. And it can also be generalized to some high dimensional cases of Bonberry long conjecture, this new method. This, these are the advantages compared to the first uh, method. Um, the starting point is that we take a rational point and then uh, embed C uh, into J via this rational point uh, by the avo jacobi embedding. Then the CK becomes a subset of JK. Because J carries a structure of abelian group of finite rank, and JK has finite rank by model V theorem, so we have more tools to study JK than CK. Okay. Um, and what is the tool that we use? Well, we, again, we use this height function on J. Uh, but in this case, uh, in fact, this height function can be made better. We have a normalized height function. It is actually a function from j q bar to uh, the set of non-negative real numbers uh, vanishing precisely on the set of torsion points. And then we can restrict it to the set of rational points and extend it linearly. The upshot, the good thing is that the, ex the extension is quadratic and it's positive definite as a quadratic form. Now we have JK tensor R being a finite dimensional real vector space by the model way theorem. So here we have a finite dimensional real vector space and a positive definite quadratic form on it. So the square root is a norm. And then JK becomes a lattice in it. Now we have a norm into clean space with a lattice. So these dotted points are JK. And some of these lattice points come from C. Those are the red points and the blue points. They are from C. Now on this Euclidean space, because we have a norm, then we can define the inner product of each two points and then the angle of each two points and so on. So this is the setup that we, we want to use this normalized height function, sometimes called, usually called the Nihon Tate height. Okay. Um, so before moving on, let's go back to the 60s. Manfold proved a formula which is which gives like the first evidence that algebraic points on curves of genus at least two are sparse. The formula, uh, a, uh, yeah, a simplified version of the formula is as follows. If we have two distinct points from C, then we have that here we have a quadratic form plus a lower term is non-negative. Now, from this one, we also see why g at least 2 is so different from g equals 0 and 1. When g equals 0 and 1, then this quadratic form is positive definite. But when g is at least 2, then this quadratic form is indefinite. And for an indefinite quadratic form, if we don't put any restrictions on the values uh, p and q, normals p and q, then a priori, this quadratic form can take any negative value as negative as possible. But Manfold's former says well, that, well, if the PQ comes from the curve, then no, it can't be too negative because it's the leading term of something that negative. So this gives a strong constraint on the pairs of P and Q. And this is really one of the first evidences that algebraic points on C are really sparse. Uh, now the actual theorem of Manfold and Voita they prove two inequalities known as Manfold inequality and Voita inequality or Manfold gap principle. Um, so the statement of theorem is on the left-hand side, but all the information is contained on this uh, on the right-hand side in this beautiful sunshine. Let's look at uh, this picture, what it says. Well, first of all, the theorem says that we can find a capital R so that we divide the Euclidean space into two parts those with norms smaller than R and those with norm larger than R. So we draw this ball. And the theorem only concerns about po on points outside this ball. So only our large points. And we will call these large points, the blue points coming from the curve C with large norm, large points. It only concerns the large points. And next, 
the theorem says that, well, we can divide these large points into different cones according to an angle. The angle is r cosine 3 over 4. Let's divide the Euclidean space into cones according to this angle condition. And we only consider large points contained in each cone. If we have a large point in a cone, then we know where to find all the other large points. Well, Manfold says that, well, these large, the other large points must be far from this first one. The norm must be at least twice the norm of P in this cone. So it's outside this part. Voita, on the other hand, proved that, well, they can also not be too far. They must be, cont they must be uh, contained in this uh, arc uh, with radius at most kappa times the norm of P, where kappa is a number depending only on the genus of the curve. So if we have a large point P here, then all the other Qs are here. And this is a compact set. So in each cone, there are only finally many large points because there are lattice points contained in the compact set. set. And we, we have divided the Euclidean space into finally many cones. Uh, so there are only finally many large points. But better because we have these, these numbers here. First of all, we have this angle condition and we know that uh, by elementary parking argument, we only need this many cones to cover the whole Euclidean space. Seven to the power of the rank of JK which is the dimension of the Euclidean space. This is the number of cones. And in each cone, we, only, we also have an upper bound for the cardinality of large points. Well, this is because we, we have P1 to Pn large points in a cone where P lies. In this cone, we have P1 to Pn with non-decreasing uh, norms. Then by Voita, the norm of Pn is, is, at is at most kappa times the norm of P. By Manfold, successively, the norm of Pn is larger or equal to 2 to the power of n times the norm of P. And then the norm of P cancels out in this inequality so that n is at most log 2 kappa. If you count P, then it's log 2 kappa plus 1. Each cone, there are this many large points, and there are this many cones. So, now, so this proves that we have a good upper bound on the number of large points. It depends only on G and the rank of JK. Uh, now, what about small points? Well, if we only care about the finiteness, then we don't need to do anything because small points are lattice points contained in the compact set. Automatically, there are finitely many of them. So this finishes the proof of model conjecture. Uh, with a good upper bound for the number of large points, depending only on G and the model we rank. Um, even better, uh, Bombieri de Diego showed that this capital R that we use to divide large points and small points, there is an explicit formula for that. And in this division, the faulting height of the Jacobian is involved. So we have C0, C0 G times the faulting height of J. This is R square. And also the base seven here can be improved to something smaller than two by Oppogate. Anyways, we do have a nice bound for the number of large points and we know what are the large points. So the, uh, the, the radius is given by an formula uh, in, depending on the fountain height of J. Uh, now for, bound, for the classical bound of CK, David Philippon and Raymond proved that, okay, there are four invariants and in, enters in this bound. Uh, the, the, the coordinate can be bounded in terms of the genus, the degree of the number field, this falling height, and the model we rank, okay? So compared with the number of large points, the classical bound also has the degree of the number field and the falling height, okay? Um, now, let's make a summary of classical results. On the left-hand side, we have the different grades of the questions. We do want to know the finiteness and upper bound. On the right-hand side, we have some results concerning the sparsity of algebraic points. We have Manifold's inequality, which says the large points are far from each other. Uh, a lot, lot, yeah. And Void has inequality, which says that well, they can also not be too far. And we know where to search these large points as soon as we know one large point, which is usually the biggest problem. Anyways, uh, now a natural question arises. Can we say something about the sparsity of small points? Uh, yeah, and 
uh, this is the question that we want to ask. Now we want to look for some uniform bounds uh, about the cardinality. First of all, before proving, trying to prove any uniform bounds, let's see how uniform it can be. First of all, well, this cardinality must depend on the genus and the degree of the number of fields. This can be shown by some simple examples here. So now there is a very ambitious bound. Is it possible to bound the cardinality of the, uh, uh, the set of rational points solely in terms of the genus and the degree of the number of fields? Um, this question has an affirmative answer if one assumes a widely open conjecture of von Bieri and Long, uh, or a conjecture of Long, um, on rational points of variety of, of general type. So you have a family of curves of genus at least two to take a high enough power. Uh, this result was proved by Caporazzo, Harris, Mazur, uh, improved by uh, Abramovich and, uh, and Bacelli. Again, there are two divergent opinions on, uh, towards this conditional results. Either one believes that this ambitious bound should be true, or one says that, okay, this bound can't be true, and one should modify the conjecture of von Bieri law. Um, okay, so this is what is not known. Um, now, here is a bound which is proved uh, in a joint work with Dimitrov and Haberger. Uh, it is known as Mazur's conjecture B. It says that if the genus is at least two, then the, car the cardinality of the set of rational points is bounded above solely in terms of G, the degree of the number field, and the model we rank. Compared with the classical result, the faulting height is no longer involved here. Uh, and later on, Kuna removed the dependence on the degree, but then the dependence on the degree uh, still appears in this model we rank. And before we prove this result by Dufantine method, it was proved in some cases by David Philippon and Nakamaye. Uh, Nakamaye. And Levent Alpoke also showed that the average number of uh, CQ is finite number when G equals two. By the Charlotte Coleman method, this result was proved for curves of small rank. Okay, so um, this is uh, a rather uniform bound that we get. Um, we also computed the following example before we proved uh, the last theorem. That is, we have a family of genus two hyperelliptic curves uh, parametrized by S, so one parameter family. In this family, because uh, uh, because the rational two uh, the to the two torsions of the Jacobians are rational, so that we do have a good upper bound on the rank, a model we rank, so that we in the end we will show that the number of rational points in this family uh, grows subpolynomially. Okay, uh, the way that we establish this rather uniform bound is to prove another phenomenon of the sparsity of algebraic points including small points. And this is a so-called new gap principle because it says that algebraic points are far from each other. It says the following thing, around each algebraic point of the curve, the number of other algebraic points which are not far from it is uniformly bounded. Uniformly bounded means that the number of these, these points not far from it are bounded above solely in terms of the genus. And by not far, I mean that the distance is bounded above uh, by C1 times the faulting's height, square root of that, if you take the distance. Okay, um, first of all, this is this theorem is a result in the, in, towards the, in the type of Bogomolov conjecture proved by Yumo and Zhang. They actually proved this result, but without uh, the constant C1 and C2 depending on what. They just said, okay, there are C1 and C2 depends on C in an unknown way. Uh, in our result, it says the, on, on which invariant of C that it depends, just G. And you have this faulting's height here. So it says that algebraic points are in general far from each other for, for, uh, from the distance point of view in a quantitative way. And from this result, combined with the classical result, it's easy to get this rather uniform bound. Let me explain it. Remember that we do have already a good upper bound for the number of large points. So now let's consider the small points, which are point contained in this ball of radius capital R centered at zero. They are lattice point here. And now we try to cover this large ball by small balls of radius small r. 
how many small balls do we need to cover the large ball? Well, uh, the number is capital R over small r to the power of the dimension of the space by an elementary park packing argument. And then we do have, this is the number of balls that we need, which is capital R over small r uh, to the power of the rank. So it's C not over C1 to the power of rank. And in this quotient, the faulting type is canceled out. This is why we don't see the cancel of the faulting type. And then in each small ball, the number of points is at most C2. So in the end, you do have a bound of C2 times C0 over C1, the rank of JK. And we're done. Okay. Um, and we're done. Yeah. So this is this new gap principle that we proved. Actually, we proved it for curves of large heights and Kuna proved it for curves of small heights. Combined with these results, you get it for any curves of genus at least two. Okay. Um, now we do have this rather uniform bound. Let's make a summary uh, at this point. Um, on the right, on the right hand side, we have another way to describe how sparse outright points are, including small points. And with this, uh, uh, so these three things combined together, which will imply this rather uniform bound. So now the cardinality of the set of rational points is bound, is uniformly bounded, subject to the model we rank. And next, uh, what is effective model? Well, Effective model is almost the ultimate goal in this uh, in this study. I say almost because it won't imply for mass last theorem, for example. But it really tells us where to find the rational points. It's a conjectural statement, and the slogan is there are no large rational points. Okay. What does it mean? Well, it says the following thing. There exists an effectively computable number depending only on the genus, the degree of the number field, and the discriminant of the number field, such that all points are small points for this number. If we can prove this one, then we know where to search all the rational points, and then uh, we can run an algorithm. But this is far from being uh, far from reached now. Very little is known. Uh, some results in this direction uh, by uh, Gagoli, uh, Veneziano, and Yada. Uh, they prove it when C is a subset, uh, when J is a subset of the copy of elliptic curves with some rank condition following the method of Manning and Demianco. Okay, another method to study this rational point, rational points, or to find the rational points, is the Charlotte Coleman Kim method. Um, they uh, Sometimes they can get, they can compute a set of rational points by by obtaining very sharp bounds on the cardinality when the rank is small when the rank is small. Currently, it is known for rank at most g. Uh, there's a classical Shabotti Coleman method. Uh, it's, uh, it is it works in the following way. So you have C embedded into this Jacobian. So CQ is a subset of JQ. On the other hand, taking, uh, taking a, a prime number, CQ is also a subset of CQP. And you also embed both of JQP and C, uh, JQ and CQP into JQP uh, yeah, here. Um, then one can show that the, the closure of JQ is an analytic subvariety of piatic subvariety of JQP, and the dimension is the most the rank of that. So if the rank is smaller or equal to G, then here you have something of dimension G, here you have something of dimension at most G minus one, here you have something of dimension one, then CQ lies in the intersection of both of them. And in a general position, this intersection is a finite set, so it is finite. So actually, Shaboti used this to prove a model conjecture for curves of, G, uh, of model weight rank at most g minus one. And Coleman made this method more effective uh, by proving sharp bounds. Uh, but here we see why we need this rank condition because we want this intersection of the two sets to be unlikely. Well, the problem for them to, uh, and the problem to uh, lose this condition is that jq has dimension g. 
So if we can find a space of a bit larger dimension, then we have a hope to make this method work a little bit better. And uh, now this is realized for quadratic Shabo T. Uh, a geometric, so, so quadratic Shabo T now it works well for curves of rank G, uh, of rank G and uh, especially for modular curve, uh, in various publications of Jennifer Balakrishnan in collaboration with uh, Besser, Muller, Tweetman, Dogra, and so on. A geometric point of view of this quadratic Shabo T was given by Eric Solvin and Guido. So the idea is to extend this space J to get something larger in which to see in this. And their idea is as follows. So you have this abel Jacobi embedding, and then you have J times J dual. On J times J dual, we have the Poincare tosser. We have the Poincare tosser. And now if we fix any morphism from J to J dual, we have a morphism from J to J cross J dual, and we can pull back this Poincare tosser. And we ask, when, for which kind of F does this embedding lift here to this total space of the pullback of the Poincare tosser? And Alex Alvin Guido showed that this exist, the lifting exists if and only if the degree of F is, uh, is zero. And from this one, because this is a tosser, GM tosser over J, and because we have this many Fs, which are good. So in the end, we can produce a taller bundle, a tosser. Uh, okay, this is actually a GM and tosser uh, over J. Um, and T has dimension, T has dimension G plus the rank of uh, the Nihon Sevichi group. So in the end, um, the quadratic Shabu, quadratic Shabu T proved the finiteness if your rank, the model we rank, is smaller than G plus the Nihonsevich rank. Uh, but to run this algorithm, compute a set with uh, getting a good upper bound, sharp upper bound, uh, you need uh, currently uh, is for, for the rank being J, uh, being G. Okay, so this is the uh, Shabuti called Mankin method. It also lies into this idea of analytic section, although in the periodic setting. And here we see this P, uh, P star. Uh, which is quadratic. It's actually closely related to the height function that we mentioned before on J. Uh, it also comes from Poincare tosser. So even though these two methods are different, one of them is like Archimedean, one of them is more piadic, they do share some similarities, this quadratic thing. Okay, this is what I want to mention uh, about uh, uh, genus at least two curves uh, on, on the effective model uh, part. Now, let me turn to the proof of Dimitrov, Gauhebegger, and Kuna, this new gap principle. Let's see, what are the ingredients in this proof? Well, here, here is the statement. Um, in this statement, we see two heights. First of all, we have Q minus P, which is a point on C minus C. And we know that C minus C is a sub variety of J uh, canonically defined because the base point of the Abel Jacobi embedding is canceled out. So now we do have a sub variety C minus C in the Jacobian, and we have a point on it. Here on the left hand side, we have a point, we have the height of the point on the Jacobian. On the right hand side, we have the height of the Jacobian. Okay. And what we want to do is we sort of want to compare the height on the Jacobian and the height of the Jacobian. When one reasonable way to do that is to consider all these curves together, all these Jacobians together to form the modular space and universal curve. So we've put them together, study the modular space of curves of genus G with the universal curve. Okay, this is the first step. And now this height function we, have, we, we do have this relative Jacobian here, we have this relative Jacobian here, and this height function on the Jacobian becomes a height in this total space, but fiber-wise defined. So we have this H hat fiber-wise defined. And the height of the Jacobian, it becomes a height on the base, because each, each point in the base parametrized in Jacobian. So we have a height on the fiber-wise defined height and the height on the base. We sort of want to compare these two heights. 
which our a priori there's no hope that there is a comparison on the by them just by the nature. One of them is there's fiber wise. One of them is the, on the base. A priori, we cannot expect to compare them. But we also work on a sub variety of the family version of the C minus C, which I denote in this way. So somehow we do have a sub variety in this relative Jacobian, which becomes a sub variety in the universal uh, universal abelian variety. And we want to find the correct condition for this x sub variety x so that this fiber wise height is bounded below by the height on the base. So even though these two heights are not comparable a priori, we do want to find the correct condition for x, for sub variety of x, so that they are comparable when restricted to this sub variety. Yeah. And this is done in the sequence of work a joint with Habegger and Dimitrov, which show the following thing. So these two heights are comparable somehow uh, uh, on the Zariski open dense subset, if and only if x satisfies some linear algebra property called non-degenerate. Uh, this non-degeneracy is expressed using Betty map introduced by Lars Renzani. And a better way to understand this, in my opinion, is to see it as the bigness of some line bundle. And this line bundle was later on constructed by Yuan and Zhang, that identic line bundle. And then this linear algebra property is equivalent to the tautological identic line bundle on the universal abelian variety is big when restricted to x. So this identic line bundle itself is not big, but um, x is, um, but it's big restricted to x. So what we want to show now is that, okay, we want to find condition, geometric condition on X so that this line bundle is big on S when restricted to big, okay, uh, to X. Um, another thing I want to mention before moving on is this definition of non-degeneracy. I won't give the exact definition, but I want to mention one particular case where it's easily degenerate. That is, if X has dimension greater than G, then X is degenerate just by the definition of this non-degeneracy, which I didn't include in this talk. Well, because this condition is so easy to check, we call these varieties naive degenerate. And unfortunately or fortunately, this CG minus CG, or this family version of C minus C, it is degenerate simply by dimension reasons. So that's why we can't prove that every two algebraic points are far from each other. Well, it's also not true. So it's not the bad news, it's not bad news. Okay. Uh, and the next, the second part of the proof of Dimitrov uh is the, this geometric criterion for X to be non-degenerate. Uh, this is done uh, in 2020. Um, so uh, I, I, I defined for each such X, a so-called degeneracy locus for each uh, integer. And this degeneracy locus uh, was shown to be, uh, it was defined as a, as a union of something, something satisfying some unlikely intersection conditions. And I proved that this degeneracy locus is in fact uh, Zarsky closed and give the uh, criterion for the degeneracy locus to be the whole X. An application is towards this degenerate uh, degeneracy. That is, X is degenerate if and only if X is built up from something naive degenerate. So this is what the theorem says. Uh, the actual statement is a bit long, but it's geometric and it can be checked in each practice, each individual case. And some applications, uh, some applications of this theorem, for example, for Mazur's theorem, for Mazur's conjecture, uh, th it is this construction that we make. So C minus C is not non-degenerate. The family version of that is bad, but if we do more, if we do more about this, this different thing, when M is large enough, it is non-degenerate. And this is uh, the, the thing that the one that we, the X that we use to prove this result, to prove this result. Okay, this is the X that we use to prove this result uh, about rational points on, mod, uh, on curves of genus at least two. And this can be used also used to construct other non-degenerate sub varieties to apply this height inequality and Kuhner's equal distribution result. So in the end, we get a full uniform model long conjecture, which is about 
uh, rational points on sub-varieties or uh, in abelian varieties, in abelian varieties. Uh, and later on, uh, recently uh, with Heidegger, we solved the relative many manifold conjecture, which is a result about torsion points, algebraic torsion points in families of abelian varieties when they intersect with uh, sub varieties, when they intersect with sub varieties. Uh, and in this application, we use x deck one. Okay. So this is the proof ingredients of, uh, uh, of this rather uniform bound. Uh, the two parts. Uh, next, I want to mention some questions, some further questions related to this rather uniform bound. Uh, here, here is the bound that we mentioned. So now I write it down as C2G times CG to the power of rank of JK, where C2 is the number of points in each small ball and C is C0 over C1. The square root of that. Okay. First question is, now we separate this space into two parts. How does these two parts depend on G? Let's look at the first part. How does C2G grows as G goes to infinity? Well, first of all, this number must go to infinity because at least in the number in the small balls, we have all the rational torsion points. And for the, the, the number of rational torsion points must go to infinity by looking at such examples by looking at such examples. So they must go to infinity. But then how fast does it go to infinity? Does it go into infinity in a polynomial way or either a linear way or not? Well, over number field is completely unknown. There is no explicit formula. Over function field, it is known, it is proved by Looper, Serum, and Rose. And they proved a bound uh, uh, at the cost of g, g squared. Um, the reason that the, the proof of Looper, Silverman, Wilms doesn't work over number fields is that uh, for the, in the, over the number fields, we have the Archimedean place where we cannot use uh, John's theory of phi graph, uh, phi, graph and so, uh, phi graph and so on. We must study the green, car, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the green functions and so on. And that is not known. So over number fields, is not, there's no explicit formula. And uh, for, from some proofs uh, of the uniform many method conjecture, one can extract maybe some explicit formula, but they are not gonna be very practical. Instead, here is a more interesting question that one can try to answer. Now here in the C2, we have all these small points, well, points of bounded, but the distance is smaller equal to C1 times the faulting's height. But Instead, if we just look at the rational torsion points, what can we say? Well, first of all, I introduce this notation, uh, torsion packet of C, including P. It is the set of rational torsion points uh, on C uh, when we use the when we embed C into J based at P. Um, Baker and Poonen in 2001 proved that the cardinality of the torsion packet is essentially at most two. So for each individual curve, the number of points such that it has larger uh, torsion packet is, is bounded. It's a finite number and is bounded solely in terms of C. But again, it's not known how it depends on C. And the question that we can ask is, can we make Baker and Poonen's result more uniform? up to replacing two, maybe by six. And this is, and in fact, uh, this question is somehow suggest, suggested by a new proof of this uh, uniform many manifold conjecture uh, by, by Haberger and myself. So the way relative many manifold conjecture implies uniform many, many manifold conjecture, one can, one can ask this question. Is it possible to make Baker and Poonen's result uniform solely in terms of G? Okay, so this is for the C2 part. And we also have the CG, the other part CG. For this part, we actually expect some more uniformity. For example, is it true that this CG is completely bounded? Uh, there's an absolute bound, upper bound for CG independent of G. And even better, does it go to one when G goes to infinity? Um, this question is reasonable in view of Manfall's formula here. 
because this leading term, this quadratic form, it's more and more indefinite when g gets larger and larger. So if we try to use this kind of quasi-orthogonality to prove the finiteness to full model conjecture, we will see that it's harder and harder to find rational points when g go when g becomes larger. Okay. And in fact, for large points, uh, it's almost known, uh, although read, not written anywhere, because the angle condition in both inequalities, I mean Manfold inequality and Volta inequality, they can be improved. They can be improved. Uh, so we can use some uh, advanced packing arguments by have got Vankatesh and so on. Uh, and still, the problem is, comes from the number of small points. And for this one, we need a more precise version of Manfold's formula. And uh, another dire direction is on arithmetic statistics uh, for this uniform bound, uh, the average number of rational points. Uh, Levan Alpoke proved uh, proved before the, the result of the initial Gaha bigger that the number of the average number of rational uh, rational points on genus two curves and rational is really k equals q is bounded uh, is a finite number. So this is known for genus two curves where stress uh, at base at vast trust point and so on. On the other hand, um, Bagava and Gross proved that when k equals q, then the average of two to the power of the rank is a finite number for hyperelated curve having a rational value trust point. So for example, if we focus on hyperelliptic curves, if we can prove that the CG tends to one, then by Bagara gross, the average of two to the power of the rank is gonna be a finite number, then we can show that when G is large enough, then the average number of uh, rational points on hyperelliptic curves uh, will be a finite number. So this this rather uni this further uniform bound, conjectural uniform bound, will have some consequence uh, in arithmetic statistics also. Okay. Uh, and I prepare a few slides about integral points uh, on elliptic curves. Um, uh, we know that for elliptic curves, uh, to study rational points, we sometimes have this torsion uh, torsion free parts so there are finally many of them but for elliptic curves we can also talk about integral points um, and in my talk I will focus on just one very particular case well it's not so particular just focus on Q and Z we will have we will write a elliptic curve defined over Q in the well stress model like this and we use easy to denote the set of integral solutions to this well stress uh, uh, where's trust equation. First of all, Siegel proved that EZ is a finite set. So again, finiteness is proved. In fact, Siegel also proved the finiteness of uh, uh, any a curve of genus at least one, uh, well, any curve, yeah. Um, but but his his result was uh, was covered by uh, faulting this result when the curve has genus at least two. But again, Siegel's proof is not constructive. Um, so for a uniform bound, for a bound, there exists a bound, but for a uniform bound, it is still not known. And the conjecture of Long says that, well, if we fix a minimal model, then the number of rational, uh, uh, the integral points is bounded above absolutely uh, in terms of the rank of the model they rank. Here, assuming the model is minimal is necessary because otherwise you can't expect to have any uniform bound. The conjecture of long is a very strong one. For example, it will imply Mazur's result uh, on the rational torsion points on elliptic curves. And Silverman proved this result, but including bad reduction places. And this result was later improved by Antri and Silverman uh, involving the spiral quotient. And um, in particular, long's conjecture follows from the ABC conjecture, because one equivalent, uh, equivalent statement for ABC conjecture is that the spiral quotient is bounded above a six plus epsilon, except for finite many big curves. And there are some unconditional results in arithmetic statistics. And again, we want to have some effectiveness that is given any big curve, the well trust model, can we determine the set of integral solutions? And again, little is known in this direction. Um, but here is a conjecture which is more uh, achievable. This is the growth of integral and rational points. Again, 
by more achievable, I only mean it more achievable by, uh, by uh, than the effective effectiveness. Um, so the number of integral points is expected to grow exponentially in terms of the faulting's height. And for rational points, you may bound the height of the, bond, the points. And then if the height is larger, if this height, this B is larger than the uh, height of the uh, the height of the elliptic curve, then you also expect the, the number of this, these points to be to grow exponentially in this height, in the small h. Um, and Bombieri and Zanier proved the rational point part if E has non trivial uh, two torsion, rational two torsion points, if the full group is non uh, yeah, it, if you have the full group. And Nacarado improved this if you have just at least one non-trivial rational two torsion points. And the work uses also uh, the proof of Han and his Silverman. And it's important to work with the number field K because the uh, number field Q, because it need the class number to be one. In the end, I want to mention one conjecture, which is this conjecture is one of my favorite conjectures in uh, theory conjectures. That is the uniform boundedness conjecture. It claims that for any abelian variety defined of genus at least uh, genus G uh, defined over Q, the number of torsion, uh, torsion rational torsion points is bounded above solely in terms of dimension, and it will follow from a conjecture of Long Sureman about heights. But this conjecture, of course, it's very open. Uh, it's only known uh, when G equals one by Maser by Maser, uh, but Maser's proof uh, there's little hope to generalize it to high dimensional cases. Yeah, so I think uh, I'll stop here. Thank you.